everyone, welcome back to ALS Online. Um, all right, we're back with part 28 of our physical geography series. Okay, moving on to our next part of our mass movements, um, looking at factors and its effects. All right, so in this part, okay, I'm going to be looking at what are the, the various factors that actually cause mass movements. Um, so the mass movements types that are actually caused, okay, you have to look back um, to part one. All right, in my previous part, part 27, I have covered what are the different types of mass movements that can um, possibly occur, okay, as well as how do mass movements even occur in the first place, right? looking at your factor of safety as well as the angle of repose. Right? So in this part is where you're going to be looking at the factors that actually cause the factor of safety to either um, be stable or, or to lose its factor of safety safety as well as to lose its angle of repose, hence resulting, resulting in mass movements, okay, as well as its effects. All right. Um, the main bulk of this video, you're gonna be, we're gonna be looking at is factors. Okay, effects is very, very self-explanatory, and you guys can just um really go and look up for certain examples. Um, that will help to show the, the various effects, right, that actually occur as a result of mass of mass movements. Right. So let's look at factors. Jumping into our first, um, first uh first slide. Okay, we're gonna be looking at what are the different factors. Right. We're gonna be looking at internal and external factors. Right. When you look at a mass uh, mass movement. You want to be focusing on its internal. Okay, that means things like its geologic structure, anything that is made up of the slope itself. Okay, as well as its external factors, right? So things like climate, okay, things that the slope itself does not inherently possess. So external factors would be climate factors not related to the slope, and then internal would be factors that actually make up a slope. So external factors, okay, we've got these four various uh, factors. We're going to be looking at climate, changes in, in availability of water, which is somewhat related vegetation and soil as well as anthropogenic activities which is basically human activities all right so firstly we have got climate okay climate of course is going to be the most important factor all right um if you guys want i will always argue strongly encourage you to argue that climate is the most important right namely because it is a macro factor and it's definitely uncontrollable right human activities we can still control climate we are unable to control, right? It's up to nature to, de to determine what happens. So climate actually includes rainfall and temperature. So it influences weathering and the weight of production of weathered products, right? Namely because, or mainly because, um, in areas with high temperatures or high humidity, or either that with high amounts of rainfall, um, it will definitely speed up your processes of chemical and physical weathering, which we have learned before. So slopes that are made out of weathered products are going to be less stable. Uh, weathering may, may actually reduce the cohesion and resistance, hence reducing the shear strength. Right? Whenever you look at the various factors of external and internal factors, always link them back to your shear stress and your shear strength. So in this case, uh, weathered materials, okay, when, when your materials are actually being weathered, what happens is that it will make the slope less stable, right? Because the materials are no longer as cohesive. They have actually lost their overall um, structure. Okay, so this will also help to, I don't, this will actually cause your shear strength to reduce. Um, not only that, okay, weather products can also add weight to the slope and this increases your shear stress, right? Those of you guys who are still unsure on what shear stress and shear strength is, go and check out my, my previous part, my previous video. Okay, I'll leave it in the description below um, as to what these two concepts are, okay? Because you need to know what they are. So the next factor will be changes in availability of water. So added amounts of water will increase the weight on the slope and this would cause an increase in shear stress. Okay, every time we look at something adding weight to the slope, we are always going to link it to shear stress. Right? So for example, rising water tables can also cause an increase in the saturation, okay, um, the saturation of the surface layer. So this will now act as a lubricant. Right? The saturation, uh, the saturated surface layer is basically kind of like the layer that is right below the surface layer. Right? So it acts as a lubricant now amongst the cracks and the fissures. So this will cause an increase in your pore water pressure, which forces sediments apart, hence reducing friction and cohesiveness, and hence reducing shear strength. Alright, so this is basically the uh, causal links. Okay, when there are water tables that are rising, what happens is that the cracks in between would um, basically kind of like be filled with all this water, right? So it increases the pore water pressure, which is in between. I've gone through this before, right? Permeability and porosity. And this will force the sediments apart even more, hence co causing the cohesiveness to actually reduce, hence reducing the shear strength. Right, so this is actually correlated to climate because um, in order for that to even be a surge in the water tables, there has to be a surge in the amount of water, right? So when there's a surge in the amount of water, it's usually because of high amounts of rainfall and precipitation. Right, the next factor you have is vegetation and soil. So this is when um, vegetation, okay, the 
presence of trees, flora and fauna, they all come with roots, right? They are actually formed from roots to begin with. So the roots actually help in binding the soil together, right? It helps to strengthen the soil and stabilizes the ground. So this will actually help to take in water as well, preventing saturation point from being reached as fast. Alright, so this is just when the presence of trees and flora and fauna, right, they basically not only help to bind the soil together, right, but they also help to ensure that um, um, water is being taken in, okay, so that the, the water table does not, or I mean, or the soil does not reach saturation point as quickly. So non-saturated soil has increased cohesion, whereas saturated soil reduces friction, hence reducing shear strength, right? When there's a lot of water, okay, likewise, the pore water pressure increases. This actually causes the whole um, the whole area to be kind of, kind of like a lubricant, right? It becomes like a lubricant, becomes very, very wet. So as a result, the shear strength is going to be reduced, right? Not only that, one more point that I actually didn't add over here is that when there's heavy vegetation, right? There's a lot of trees, uh, heavy, heavy trees, which are huge they will also actually add shear stress, right? Because they will add weight to the slope. So when they actually add weight to the slope, there will be an increase in shear stress. This can actually cause mass movement to occur when your factor of safety is less than one as well. So just look at that as another factor as well. So vegetation and soil has the ability to not only um, help okay, in terms of stabilizing the ground, as well as helping to reduce the amount of water that's present in the soil, okay, but it can also come with its cons, right? In the, in the fact that it can add shear stress and can also result in saturated soil over time, right, which can actually reduce friction, hence your shear strength. Right, if you guys are still very confused with shear stress and shear strength, I really, really urge you guys, uh, like I've mentioned just now, okay, to go ahead and check out the video first, right, because I'm going to be talking about a whole lot about shear stress and shear strength because it's uh, very, very crucial, right, for this part um, on your factors. Right, next we look at anthropogenic activities, basically, basically it's human activities. So human activities may result in the slope no longer being at the angle of repose, right? What does this mean? Is that when, let's say, humans um, actually modify the slope. Okay, let's say you, you start hacking the slope, right? Um, to ensure that it, it can fit, let's say, your, your roads, okay, or it can fit um, a mining area or something like this, right? What happens is that the slope okay, may actually become um, even steeper, for instance. Okay, it may actually um, no longer have that gentle angle of repose, and this can actually cause um, mass movements to occur as well. Not only that, here, human activities through overloading or building of infrastructure may result in higher shear stress, mainly because of the added weight. Okay, and when, when humans actually modify the slope, it can actually cause a reduction in the overall cohesiveness of the materials. Okay, let's say if you replace the materials with, let's say, concrete instead. Um, while you think okay, that concrete may, be, may help to actually form uh, a stronger uh, overall... Um, up st stable ground, right? Actually, in reality, it does not. Okay, it actually causes your materials to become very, very, like, kind of, like, flustered, right? And it's all no longer going to be cohesive, right? So this will cause a reduction in your overall shear strength, right? And um, hence, that is definitely not desirable, right? Um, especially when all of these things on the slope um, pile on additional weight and increases their shear stress. So human activities is a huge um, external factor that is the only factor that could really counter climate, right? Because um, of it's difference, right? It's not it's not actually nature, right? Human we're looking at humans specifically. But you just want to make sure that when you argue this part, right? Um if you want to justify that climate is still more important, right? Uh make sure you state it very clearly that it is because climate is a macro factor and human activities can always be averted, right? We can always avoid um piling things onto the slope to make sure that the slope does not actually reach a critical ang um a critical angle of repose or either that uh, a failed factor of safety. Right then, next we look at internal factors. So, firstly, you want to gonna you, you have to realize right that in this topic, you're gonna have to want to balance it, balance the whole essay. Um, firstly, in terms of arguing climate as an important factor, as well as explaining later on why another external factor of human activities can also be as important. But last but not least, you also have to make sure you take into consideration the internal factors as well, right? Because ultimately, at the day, right, the slope may not fail if it's. Um, inherent materials that it's made out of is actually strong enough to support any human activities or any sort of climate, climatic um, uh, patterns okay, or, or rainfall or temperature. Right? If the slope itself is made out of very, very strong materials and can withstand all these. So you're going to be looking at these kind of things okay, whereby um, internal factors also actually do play a part. Right, if the in, if the overall um, internal factor of, of a slope okay, is that it's really very weak to begin with, 
then chances are with all of these different other external factors, definitely it's going to fail, right? So you want to look at the two various cases. Okay, if your internal factors, your materials that make up the slope are actually already strong to begin with, right? So if we go into this one, the first one is of course going to be the materials in the slope. So finer materials, like your sand and silk grade, will have a lower angle of repose. Okay, or the, on the other hand, coarser materials, such as boulders, will have a much steeper angle of repose. So this is very, very self-explanatory, right? If your entire slope is made out of huge boulders, right, and they're all very large and, and, and just coarse in, 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 um, in, in, in the entire slope, right, definitely your slope is going to be more susceptible to things like rock fall, rock topple, rock slide, right? Because... It is just what the slope is made out of. So in that case, in that case, what happens is that the slope is definitely going to be at a much steeper angle of repose, making it highly susceptible to uh, mass movements in terms of your rock fall, rock topple, rock slides. Okay, as compared to a slope which is made out of very very uh, finer sediments. Okay, to to begin with, um, these kind of slopes will definitely be much gentler. Right, and if anything were to happen, if they're saturated with water, then chances are the type of mass movement that will come out would be things like mud flow, things like landslide. Um, any of these other kinds of mass movements instead. All right, so if you want, you can always use these kind of factors to tie it in right, into your different kinds of mass movement types that can actually occur as a result as well. Alright, the next one will be your geologic structure. So this is when we have got things like joints and fissures. So a large amount of joints and fissures would actually cause a reduction in your shear strength. Right, if the majority of rocks are aligned downwards towards the ground, detached masses of rock will also be able to slide over a sliding plane. Here, on the other hand, if they're facing upslope towards the sky, okay, what happens is that rock layer cannot slide down as easily. That this will actually lead to a more stable slope. Okay, what do I actually mean by this? Right, if you look at the first case, okay, let's call this case one, case two. All right, the first case is when all your rocks, right, let's say this is a slope. Right, all the rocks are actually let's say this is um. Think, think of it like, like, a, like a slope, okay? So it's facing downwards. So all your rocks are actually kind of like facing very, very nicely downwards. Right, this is case one, right? Case two is when you actually have a case whereby you still have the same downslope, but your rocks are like all facing upwards instead. Okay, let's say the rocks are facing upwards. Okay, I can't really draw it very, very well over here. It's a bit hard to draw, right? But essentially what happens is that on one case, all your rocks are very nicely facing downwards. On the other hand, on your other case, they are not facing downwards, they're all facing upwards instead. Right? So naturally what happens is that when your rocks are going to be facing upwards, the overall rock layer that's going to be on top is not going to be able to slide down as easily. Right? Because of the friction, right? If you've got one force, this is a bit of physics here, if you've got one force that is heading down this way, which is the slope, Okay, and another force of your rocks which is pushing backwards, okay, naturally the, the rocks aren't going to slide down, right? Because both forces will cancel each other. So this is basically a more physical point, a more, more physics point of view um, when there's a difference in terms of the way in which your rocks are facing, right? They can cause a different type of sliding to occur, right? So usually if they're aligned align downwards towards the ground, chances are you have a nice sliding plane. Your landslides uh, are more likely to occur. Slums are more likely to occur. All right. Then we look at the effects of mass movements. Right. These effects that I've I have over here, I've really combined it uh, and try to make it as simple as possible to understand. So effects are very very straightforward. If you have got more in your head, just go ahead and add them on. Right. These are very very general effects. Uh, reason being is that mass movements, when it comes to your essays, I recommend that you always try and do it um, case study driven. So find a good case study of a previous mass movement that has occurred and use that mass movement um, which has occurred before, right? That catastrophe that has occurred before, right? Use the effects that have come thereafter to actually sub substantiate your examples as well as your explanation in terms of the e actual effects of mass movements, right? So the first one we have over here is going to be looking at your economic effects. So when you've got damages to property, what happens is that it will definitely result in high monetary costs to actually rebuild and fix, refix KD's infrastructures. Next, you have got social effects in terms of your lives uh, when there's psychological impacts. Uh, when there's a loss in sentimental items and death, okay, this can actually cause emotional and mental stress. So this is your very, very normal um, social effect, right? When there is a um, natural disaster that occurs, naturally death is, deaths are going to be more apparent. This will actually lead to greater um, psychological Im impacts when you have got people who um, 
lose their loved ones, when you've got people who lose sentimental items, this is all going to have an effect on people's mental health and their overall well-being. So that is actually a social effect. Uh, next is going to be your environmental effects. So if and you have got a Land, uh, last not, not, not land side, sorry, uh, mass movement. Naturally, you're going to have physical changes and modifications to the surroundings, right? And not only that, okay, when you have got things like mud flow, uh, the very watery ones with a lot of different types of materials in them, for example, your rotational slips, your rotational, uh, I mean, your, your slums. What happens is that soil degradation is going to happen. Okay, mud flows, landslides, and this can be harmful for living organisms in the area and can actually cause right, environmental degradation in the long run. Right, When there is soil um, erosion, soil degradation, it's very, very hard for your soil to actually kind of like get back to normal. Right, So this is one of the effects that comes with um, that comes with your, your mass movements. Right, it, it is an environmental effect that actually happens. Um, soil degradation is a real issue that will come with uh, mass movements such as your mud flows, landslides, so on and so forth. Alright, so then that is actually all of your effects, right? So effects, like I've said, can okay, actually go and look for your own case studies and use those case studies to substantiate and back up your um, different types of effects. Alright, if you've got more to add on, just go ahead and add them on. Uh, I'm sure you guys will have some very, very strong um, different types of effects as well. Alright, so lastly, exam requirements, okay, all you need to do for this entire part, okay, on part two of your mass movements, right, is to be able to explain and discuss the factors that affect or cause mass, mass movements, as well as to explain the effects of mass movements, and this can be case study driven as well. Okay, it's, of course, it's up to you. You don't have to always have it driven by case studies if you want. Here, you can have it point driven, okay, it's completely up to you, whatever floats your boat. Um, but all in all, okay, for this part, I want you guys to just make sure that you really master the factors very well, right? Factors of mass movements are very, very crucial because, like I've said just now, it's really a three-pronged approach. You're looking at climate, you're looking at humans, and lastly, you're looking at the actual internal factors that make up a slope. That is what is unique about this part of mass movements, is that you need to, you, you have to be able to formulate an argument that ensures that all three areas are being targeted, right? That end of the day, um... Even if your slope, okay, is made up of the the strongest of materials, right? If climate is so so um impactful, right, and, and able to operate on such a huge scale, definitely the slope is not gonna be able to withstand any of those. Right. But on the other hand, okay, if your human activities are also very apparent on a very, very um weak slope, for instance, then naturally the human activities are actually gonna cause the the the, the mice uh, right of your slope and it's going to cause slope failure so you want to look at the three different areas okay, of your internal factors external factors of climate and external factors of humans and then after that come to a very very strong justification as to which one of them is going to be your strongest um, argument all right for me i would still go with climate um, but it's definitely up to you you can fight your own case go ahead and have um, a bit of fun okay in terms of experimenting which one you feel the most comfortable in all right so that is all i have for mass movements here on part two our part 28 of entire physical jog series we are really coming to the end of our entire physical jog series very soon so you can continue to stay tuned okay for the last few parts to come um if you have any questions you can always leave in the comment section below or find me on my instagram or facebook um i will answer questions there you guys already know it um, I think some of you guys have already been asking questions and I've been answering them quite frequently. So if not, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to give it a like as well as to subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything and it really helps me out a lot. So it would be great if you could just hit that button for me. Um, if not, that's all I have. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.